Let's move on to our uh, next speaker is uh, from Aerolytics, um, Tom Everly. Tom is a technologist and an entrepreneur focusing on creating actionable data to help farmers achieve their precision agriculture goals. He holds a master's degree in electrical engineering. He started several small businesses. He said he's always been fascinated from his youth um, working with uh, radio controlled aircraft. He actually in the 1990s uh, started with a 35 millimeter camera strapped on to some device and but he said that really didn't work too well but so he has developed um, Aerolytics um, his business so he's here to he's actually gonna he was here last week he flew over the Y did some imaging uh, he's back today he's gonna show us some of those images that he took and then when he gets done we're gonna take a break I'll tell you how long depending on how long we go we're going to take a break and then we're going to do a demo. We're going to walk to the back side of that pond and he's going to actually do a demo. So there'll be two demos today, one on a hard wing UAV and one on the multi-copter like we saw that John presented. So Tom, thanks for being here. This, this thank work. you, Jenny. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's right. Vanna's coming with them. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, thank you, John. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I, I like the, the the little launcher thing, although I don't have one of those that looks really neat with the bungee cords. But uh, one point that you made, and it's always been my vision, is in the future, having these UAVs that live out in the field on some type of antenna somewhere, and they just kind of swoop down, gather all this data, and send it up to the cloud, and then give you all the, all the information that you need. And uh, I think that's something that we can look for in the future. Okay, so uh, this doesn't look like one of my slides. <laughs> so today I'm gonna fly um, this UAV, it's a fixed wing UAV, and uh, it's called a Skywalker. It's uh, battery operated. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it today, but I'm also going to talk about UAVs and drones in, in general, no problem. Okay, so we'll just um, move right along and uh, talk about terminology. I just don't like drone. It has such a negative connotation. So I'm trying to get the world to change from the word drone to a UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAS or something. And really what it means is that um, there's no human pilot on board flying the aircraft. Right? Doesn't necessarily mean it's autonomous, it's just nobody's on board flying it. Uh, there's really three types that are being used in agriculture. The two on the left are the ones that I'm going to talk mostly about today. The one on the right is this Yamaha um, version that uh, is doing the spraying and it's really crazy to see this thing fly. If you are interested, you can go to YouTube and, and check it out, but um, this thing is um, you know, bigger than this table here and uh, it's just pretty amazing, it's all autonomous. Really the, the difference between the fixed wing and the multi-rotor, I tried to highlight them here, is really the flight endurance um, and the amount of acreage that they can, um, that they can cover. Right? Fixed wing obviously has um, lift built into the wing so it needs less energy in order to fly. Uh, I think I've read that it's five times the energy compared to a multi-rotor so you would expect that, that it would take uh, less, less energy to fly. Um, the other thing is that um, it does need to be launched and uh, retrieved in a landing where the multi-rotor is, um, it can take off, vertical takeoff and landing, and uh, that can be automated. Of course, you just saw the, uh, the landing on a fixed wing can be automated as well. Um, but it's really um, the acreage and the amount of time in the air. And I think we have a uh, Agra I is here and they're talking that they can fly for um, I think over 30 minutes with their multi-rotor and that's pretty good. I'm interested in covering a lot of ground and uh, that's why I'm focused on really the, uh, the fixed wing. So lots of, um, lots of benefits. Um, just having a bird's eye view. I know a lot of farmers tell me if I could just see my corn crop from above, it would be great because once it gets too high, I just have no idea what's going on. So I'll give you some, uh, show you some images today that I took from the, I think it's called the YI1 and 2 field here at the, re at the uh, research center. Um, 
the thoroughness as well. Just being able to fly the entire field uh, instead of only scouting a portion of it is great. And being able to have a targeted scout, being able to go over to uh, an area that you think that there's um, stress happening and be, be able to look at that and be really focused on how you're doing that uh, saves quite a bit in efficiency. And there's, there's many other types of things. And what we're all headed towards is the big data, big data analytics, being able to take that information, create zone maps, and be able to, um, to use that information to, to increase yield, reduce your inputs. So I get this question quite a bit, so I thought I'd just spend a couple of minutes on it. Um, can I fly a UAV on my farm? So here's something interesting from um, uh, a reporter in Oklahoma uh, who interviewed this fellow, Les Dorr, from the Office of UAV, right? And so this is what um, the Office of UAV at the FAA said, farmers may operate an unmanned aircraft over their own property for personal use and guidelines for the operation of model aircraft, such as those published by the Academy of Model Aeronautics, may be used by farmers as a reference for safe model UAS operations. Pretty amazing that somebody actually said that from the FAA. So, so what are those... So what do those, um, those guidelines say? Back in uh, 1981, the FAA... Um, advised the, the Model Aircraft Academy that we'd like you to op operate from, uh, away from populated areas, don't fly near spectators, don't fly higher than 400 feet, and, within th and don't fly within three miles of an airport and give right away to full aircraft. So that's what we're talking about in terms of what we want to do if we do decide that we're going to fly. However, um, just in June, the FAA made an interpretation of, of a special, this special rule for model aircraft, aircraft, and it follows this moder the Modernization Reform Act of 2012 that Congress has asked FAA to come up with a plan for integrating UAVs into the national airspace. And what, um, what they did was they, they, they said that hobby and recreational use of UAVs is pr protected by an act of Congress. And they, they offered this interpretation. What do they mean by hobby and recreation use? And they give this example, right? What's allowed is viewing a field to determine whether crops need water when they are grown for personal enjoyment, okay? <laughs> What's not allowed is determining whether crops need to be watered that are grown as part of a commercial farming operation, okay? As well, right, they've made it clear that there shall be no changing, money changing hands for commercial purposes in flying UAVs. So um, I'm not a lawyer. You can, you know, I don't play one on TV. You, you can make up your own mind. This is just information. And I'm sure you read uh, a, lot, a lot about what's going on in the industry and the FAA trying to keep up. But something has happened where, um, where the film industry has asked for a separate um, uh, like a judgment or, or decision, and the agriculture industry has as well, and we're expecting to hear something before the end of next year that's going to give um, farmers in the agriculture industry, you know, um, the ability to do something. So let's wait and see what happens there. Okay, so let's get into this um, aerial imaging. Uh, what what equ equipment's necessary? Really, there's um, the platform, which is what you're looking here, fixed wing or multi-rotor. Um, you need a radio control receiver. I'm going to go into this in more detail. Telemetry radio, a flight control computer. You also need a, a sensor or camera, a ground control station, a radio, a radio controlled transmitter as a backup so that you can take control of this thing if it gets away, and um, some type of software and way of processing your data at the end. So um, with regards to the platform, here's um, a fixed wing platform. It has uh, servos in the wings for the ailerons and the rudder and the ele elevator, so little motors that, um, that make those control surfaces move. Uh, the important part is uh, the radio control receiver. So this means that when you see me out there flying, the box I'm holding is a radio controlled receiver, right? So um, that allows me to take control and manually or with assistance from the from the computer on board to fly the airplane. Uh, then a telemetry radio. So what's happening is the airplane is 
is sensing altitude and orientation and GPS information and all of this type of data is coming back to your ground control station, a, a tablet, computer, laptop, and it's giving you information on what's going on with the airplane. And it's all being logged both in the airplane and, and on your ground control computer as well. And um, in the flight control computer, there's all kinds of stuff. And most of this stuff has come out of the mobile phone industry um, and, and the reduction in cost of all these sensors, like the GPS and the magnetometer and accelerometer and gyroscope and all these other things that are inside that uh, allow this airplane to fly on its own. So um, inside the platform for the power system, we have uh, an ability to monitor the voltage and how much current is being used during the flight. We have um, a lithium polymer battery that uh, is a, a very good type of battery for this type of application, a brushless electric motor, and a motor controller that um, is an input in between the motor and the computer to tell it how fast, how fast to go. And then uh, here is uh, the handheld radio uh, transmitter. And um, using the different switches on the radio, I can command the, the airplane to go into different modes. For example, a uh, stabilized mode, which means if I um, let my hands off of any of the sticks, the, um, the UAV will fly at the same altitude, straight, at the same speed, and uh, just be stable. Right? Another one is fly-by-wire, where you can use the sticks to turn left, turn right, and the computer is actually providing aileron, rudder, and elevator all at the same time to make sure that it's a coordinated turn. Things that will make it easy for people that don't spend a lot of time to do this, but maybe can play a video game, that they can fly this. There's also a couple of other modes. John mentioned some of these in the... Um, in the, the product that he was talking about from Trimble, there's a return to launch. So you flip another switch and no matter where it is in its mission, it'll just come back and, and do circles above you um, at a certain prescribed al altitude. And there's uh, a loiter, which means uh, whatever you're doing, stop and just start circling. And then there's the uh, autonomous mode, which means go fly the, the mission that I've uploaded or downloaded to you. So you'll need a sensor. There's a bunch of different types. Tetracam was mentioned before. Um, they're uh, normal RGB type um, cameras, uh, near infrared or NGB cameras, video, multispectral, and hyperspectral. Some infrared, all those, those are a little bit heavier, but mostly these are the types of cam cameras and sensors that are used in the agriculture industry. The equipment um, that you'll need for the ground control station is a laptop computer with some type of mission planning software, um, a telemetry radio to receive that information from the UAV as it's flying. So here is the process, and, and John, uh, I believe, talked about this a little bit as well. So there's really four steps. We're going to collect the data, raw photos and images that are taken from above. We're going to take that image and we're going to process all of that data after we move it probably into the cloud, which is a great place to do it. Um, process it and create a geo-referenced mosaic image of, of this area of interest that you've overflown. And there's all kinds of processing that goes on to, term, to, to determine elevation and for some folks that's really important. Then that information um, needs to be analyzed. And normally, if you're using some type of uh, infrared camera or near-infrared camera, what you're doing is some type of vegetative index, whether it's normalized or, or just a difference vegetative index. By the way, this is a um, picture on the left is one that I flew over last week. I think that's the YI1 and 2 corn area. And then there's data in interpretation, which I, you know, in my mind is really the most important part of all of this. Everything else um, is, you know, getting you to the point where, okay, what are we going to do with this data and how is it going to help us, right? And creating a, a zone map or, pres you know, and prescri prescriptions for product is um, what's the important part of that. And I think other speakers have, have talked about that. I'm not going to talk about it too much today. Okay, so here's what happens um, when we're going to do mission planning. And I'm just going to go over this because you won't be able to see it uh, around the small laptop I have out in the field. But what you're going to do is um, 
use the software and outline, you might be able to see it here, outline uh, kind of um, a polygon around a, a field, a group of fields that, that you uh, are interested to survey. And then you're going to um, use an area grid function. Um, and what it'll do is automatically create a grid and a flight plan for, for this mission. And it's based on all kinds of stuff. Mostly it has to do with the camera, the, the sensor dimension in the camera, the altitude, um, the focal length of the camera, all kinds of other things. And it's going to uh, provide this, uh, and, and this is, by the way, is where you put the overlap in because you want these, um, these photos to be overlapped for image processing later. And so you have this grid, and um, the next part is to actually um, create the mission plan. So um, it's like a lawnmower type um, arrangement here where it's going to fly this pattern back and forth across the field. It has waypoints on each end and um, certain commands to tell the camera when to take photos based on distance or by a waypoint or something like that. And, um, and then some type of command that says return to launch when it's done. All of this uh, information is um, uploaded to, to the computer inside of the plane and um, then it's going to fly. So once you're out there um, flying the plane, what you're going to see on the screen is the telemetry data on the left. So it'll give you altitude and speed and orientation of the UAV. It'll show you where you are on the map because it has a GPS on board. So you can watch your progress as you're going, going through your survey. And it'll give you other types of information about airspeed, uh, direction, those types of things as well. So there's, there is another step. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. It's, it's transferring this image in, into the cloud. And it's a lot of data we're talking about, many gigabytes of data depending on the size of the field that you're surveying. And once it's all um, processed, we're talking about you know, terabytes of data, big data. So the data analysis um, is, is uh, really important. And um, a lot of this stuff I don't think is going to be successfully done on a computer at home or a really big computer. You're probably going to want to do this on some server and rent space from Amazon or something like that. That's what I do. And then data interpretation would be the last step. So um, here's the visual imagery, um, the RGB, just normal imagery of um, of the y, YI1 and 2 field that I did uh, last week. This came out really good. Uh, I obviously can't zoom in here, but um, the um, ground, resolution, ground resolution was about four centimeters per pixel. So four centimeters square on the ground equaled one pixel on the screen if you were to zoom in and look at it. And um, this would be the raw NGB data, which really doesn't mean anything to us until we process it. So this would be the difference. This is not normalized. This is the difference vegetative index. And there's um, some discussion right now about which is better normalized or unnormalized. Uh, and so I, I created both, but I'm showing the uh, difference vegetative index here. Then there is another area that uh, I did. I, t I did the entire Y Research Center. I, you really can't see it with these images. It's hard to, to see up here. But um, I broke it up into two halves, the east side and the west side, and created um, NDVI and enhanced NDVI as well for those. Dave Myers uh, is here. Dave Myers is our Ag Program Leader for the University of Maryland Extension. He's also a county Ag agent in uh, Anne Arundel County. So Dave, thanks. Back. Well, I think it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. And I just want to say that, where's Bill Morose? I know I saw him here earlier. Um, hey, Bill. Good to see Bill here. Uh, my, myself and Bill work with Tom Everly uh, with the Aerolytics Development, actually at DCI Corp uh, Grant Project, where we kind of like entrepreneurship development. And boy, it's great to see how far Tom has come with this. And it's great to see a great crowd out here to, take, to witness this, because I think uh, I think it's going to be quite enjoyable as we go into the future to watch how these unmanned aircraft become essential to farming. So I hope you all enjoy that. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jenny and, and everyone, Josh, and all those involved in, in putting on this Ag Precision Day. It's just a beautiful event. We've got a great day. So I'm not going to go any longer. Okay. I think Tom's got a yeah. few things to share with you. Yeah. I'll just uh, give you guys um, uh, a 
couple things that's going on here. So, um, so the, the plane is ready to go, but I want to remind you that um, what the steps are that we've gone through. So uh, ahead of time, what I've done is, uh, if you can remember back to some of the screenshots, I put an area of interest on a map, um, which is kind of like a big rectangle that goes over those trees, down that direction, and then all the way across, and uh, then comes back. It's just like a great big uh, rectangle. And um, I went ahead and um, programmed the flight, and I took that information, and I have downloaded it to the airplane. So what it's going to do is fly autonomously. Okay. Which means um, it's going to fly on its own, and it's got its own GPS on board. And somebody was asking, well, what if you lose a, a signal or something? There's really two signals that are involved in coming to the airplane. One is the telemetry data, which is just sending information back so I can monitor the status of the airplane. There are some commands I can send to it to change the altitude or things like that. Um, but it flies on its own. Then the other one is um, the radio that I'll have in my hand. And this allows me to tell it to, okay, now start flying on your own, or no, wait a minute, I'll fly you now, or wait a minute, I will, um, I'm telling you to come back to return to launch over me or right so it's another radio that is sending the different commands on what I want it to do so the way that this is going to work is that I'm going to hand launch it into the wind that's why I have this thing here lots of wind today and um, we're going to just climb to an altitude but there's you know some of the things that I've learned in doing this is that wind is really important on on how to survey and get good data right so it's kind of like a fish swimming upstream you want to be downstream and you want to swim across the current across the wind and make your way up so that your nose of the airplane is always turning into the wind comes back surveys nose of the air, airplane turns into the wind comes back and now um, it's a little bit a little bit windy today and um, I'm not sure if the winds coming from the right direction but it was such a great area to, to set it up this way so that you can see it, it, it may not be exactly like that. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and hand launch it. And if you see me looking inside of this box, is because this is just a poor man's hood so that I can look at, at my computer screen without the glare being too bad. And uh, Michelle over here is going to be my spotter, so she's going to be looking for other aircraft in the area. Remember, we're flying by these, these um, American modeling so uh, association rules um, and so she's gonna let me know if any aircraft come in the area or something like that and then the other thing is that I'm, I'm always gonna have visual sight of of the airplane I may sit down or look at the screen on the on and see what's going on but um, I'm always gonna have a close eye on on the airplane so uh, after it takes off I'm gonna manually take it off you're probably gonna see it like kind of dip and go straight or something I've just switched into automatic mode. Then it's going to head to that corner over there, the back corner, and then it's going to make a turn, and then it's going to fly across all the way down to the end, and then back and forth, back and forth, working its way up to here. Finally, when it gets kind of almost above us, I can't remember if it's, it might be this end or that end, I can't remember. It's going to just stop, and then it's going to come back and just start flying above. At that point, I'm going to go ahead and just take control of it again and then land it and then the demo will be op over. should take about, I don't know, five minutes or something. Maybe ten. Okay. All right. Sounds good. It's real boring after it gets going. It's really boring. Howard said he's going to make it exciting. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to arm it. So right now it's disarmed and it's beeping at me. So there's a button here. By the way, it's got a light on the top that I'm looking at that tells me it's got a good GPS signal. So now um, it's armed, so I'm going to do just a little bit of a pre-flight checklist. right? So I'm going to make sure the ailerons are working and that they're working in the right direction, as well as the elevator and rudder. And then I'm going to just check the motor. right? <clears throat> And then the other really important thing that I always do is I'm going to set it into one of the assisted modes. And I want to show you what happens when I do that. Here, let me bring this up. I don't think they can hear you. 
So if you can kind of, well, if you can see it like this. So you see the ailerons moving, right? Because the, um, the UAV is sensing its orientation. And if I go down, the rudder is going up, or the uh, elevator is going up. So you get the idea. So the computer is in control. And I just want to make sure it's in control before I throw it. <laughs> that might be important. Yeah. So now I've gone into um, assisted mode. I'm not in autonomous mode yet. I'm just in assist mode. Sure. And I'm going to get ready to. Um... Okay, so now I'm in program mode and it's going to a, a prescribed altitude. It's going to head out to its first waypoint and then it should make a turn to the left and start headed back. And these are points you set earlier. Right, these are points I set earlier. And it's monitoring its airspeed. And um, if you're interested, you can come up and take a look at the screen. You'll see that there's a map on the screen and it's starting to follow it. You're welcome to come up and look at the screen. Looks pretty clear up there. I don't. I don't see any crop dusters up there today. So this would be the point that, uh, where um, the computer is telling the camera when to take the photos. And at that altitude, which is uh, 400 feet, and it's flying at about um, 20 to 25 miles an hour right now. It's uh, taking a photo. Although I'm not taking photos, but it would be taking a photo about every three and a half seconds. Again, I'm not in control of the airplane. It's flying on its own right now, although I have the radio in my hand, so at a moment's notice, I can take control of it and have it uh, return to where it launched from. You need to come up and look at this computer screen. This is pretty nice. Pretty neat. Yeah, just make sure it's blank out. Now I'll take control of it and land it. How many feet do you need to land? Um, not too many. Tom, they want to know what the cost is. <laughs> He's laughing. No. 
that's not a good sign. It's like anything, it depends on the sensors, the batteries, and all the components that make it up. My plan is to put these together and, and try to sell them at cost, is what I'd like to do. I think that, um, that really it's the data that's the important part. So um, it certainly isn't $50,000 like the Trimble. I think that um, what the industry needs is a really inexpensive solution. So I'm trying to make it affordable for, for all farmers. How's that for a vague answer? I, you know, something around the um, five to ten thousand dollar, and and hopefully less than that. But I, I still need to put together the. I'm about thirty, thirty to sixty days away of, of putting together what that what that looks like. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you.